Good to have joy, right? Jesus gives us joy. He is joy. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Family of God. I'm glad to be a part of the family of God, aren't you? So this morning we're going to begin kind of a little mini-series of messages uh, talking about this subject, family matters, family matters. Uh, And when I talk about family matters, I'm particularly speaking concerning God's family, the church. So I'm talking about the church. Everybody say the church. The church. Uh, Kind of the, the hope and the prayer of this message or this series of messages, you would, is to encourage you uh, to be obedient to God, and maybe you're maybe you're somebody who's been coming to church here, and uh, you know we're praying for you, and you're praying that God will lead you uh, to unite with the church if that's God's will. Uh, you know, we sometimes we forget. Uh, I've been a member of let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six churches in my lifetime. Three of those I've been the pastor of. One of those I grew up at. The other I served as a deacon at. And the other it was at Mars Hill where I was a Sunday school teacher at. Uh, all those things. But one of the things that we forget about is uh, when we become a member of a church, we enter into a covenant relationship. Uh, we've already accepted Lord Jesus as our Savior. We, we belong to Him. But we, as we enter into a covenant, we, we pray and we ask God to lead us to a place that God uh, would, would have us to be at, a place to serve and to support, uh, you know, to do ministry with, alongside with. We enter a covenant with other, with other believers. That's what church, being a part of a church is, okay? Uh, and we, we want to be somewhere where God wants us to be exactly. We want to be led by the Spirit of God to do that. But one of the things that we forget about is, is in that church covenant, which most people don't talk about or read or anything like that, used to be on churches in the back, stuff like that years ago, Brother James, used to have it up in the church years ago. We don't do that anymore. But one of the things that's interesting in that, in that church covenant is, is that we say and we commit that when we leave that place, whether by moving or whatever, that we will unite with another church of like faith. That's what it says. Uh, so again, my purpose is again not to manipulate you or or to uh, try to get you to do something. What I want you to do is be obedient to God, whatever that looks like, whatever God is telling you, what He's saying to you. Uh, again, that's not my purpose. That's God's business. Okay, there's some things in, you know, that that is just God's business. All right, everybody say God's business. That's God's business, what he does. And I, what I want to do is be faithful to do what he asked me to do. And then I'm going to let him get the results and him do what he's supposed to do. All right? So we're talking about family matters. And we're going to talk about this for probably two or three weeks at the most. Uh, and again, we're talking about uh, God's family or the church. The church. Now, uh, we understand and know that um, the church is... There, there, you know, we talk about the church, there's really two uh, things that we're saying. One is the universal church. The universal church, and all the way back when I first came, we, we had this long series on, uh, on total church life, and I don't want to bring all that back or anything like that, but, but the universal church is, is made up of all people who have accepted Jesus Christ, past and present. Uh, they're a part of the church universal. That means we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, right? That's what we are. We're part of the church. Everybody say the church. Okay, we're talking about universal. We're talking about uh, the church uh, all around the world and all on the earth. We're the, the church. Those who, who are put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that makes up the church, okay? Then when we talk about a, the local church, we're talking about a, 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 cent- or a, a particular body of believers. Like, for example, we're here at Highland Baptist Church. We are a local church. We, are, we make up a, a local body of believers, Now, what do we mean by that? Every person who identifies with Jesus, uh, again, these people who are part of the church are people who have accepted Jesus Christ. Not only that, but they've just as Boone did last week. He was baptized. They've they've you know identified with Jesus through Christian baptism, and they've made a covenant with people of like faith to serve and support the local body of believers under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. In other words, all of this is is you know moot. 
uh, if we're not led by the Spirit of God to do what we're doing, to join, to be a part of a fellowship of believers, to a local church. So universal church, that's made up of all believers, wherever they might be, uh, past and present. And then the local body, is a, it can be, it's wherever you are and where God leads you to covenant with people, to join, to serve and support uh, as God leads you to be there, okay? All right, so we've got that out of the way. And we're going to talk again today, the next three weeks probably about this particular thought, uh, family matters. Acts chapter 2, turn there with me, Acts chapter 2. And when you get there, stand to your feet, okay? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now again, this, this kind of mini-series, whatever you want to call it, uh, I want to make this, this, the, this the major theme of this, is this. It's not about what you do or what you don't do. It's about what God has, is leading to do, okay? It's about what God wants us to do. We want to understand and know that God is the one who is in charge. God is the one who grows the church. God is the one who gives increase. God is the one who is the Lord of the harvest. He is the one who does all those things. So we want to focus on that because that's really what the point is of what we're talking about. Acts chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 47. We're going to read one verse. We're going to talk about the, a lot of the chapter, but we're going to, we're going to focus on the last, that last verse, that last phrase there of that Acts chapter 2. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And here's the phrase. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, God, for... Uh, forgiveness and grace and mercy. God, we are so undeserving of your love. God, we are definitely undeserving of heaven. We know, Lord, if we got what we deserve, we'd go to hell. But Lord, because you love us and because uh, your son Jesus came and took our place on the cross of Calvary and Lord paid for my sins and the sins of the entire world. And Lord, because I have placed my faith and trust in him alone for salvation. Lord, I know that one day I'll be in heaven. And Lord, I thank you for that blessed promise and assurance, Lord. God, I pray for these next few moments that you would, just, you would just bind our hearts together with your spirit. Lord, may we understand the truths of your word. May God, you just uh, meet us right where we are, wherever that's at, whether it's to be saved, whether it's, Lord, to, as we talked about, Lord, uniting with the church, Lord, whether it's to be baptized, Lord, to, to put, make a public profession of faith. God, whatever it is, you want us to do, Lord, I pray, God, that we would be willing to do that under your leadership. And again, Lord, it's not about me. It's not about this church. It's about us following you and doing your will and, and Lord, following your leadership. So, Lord, I pray that would take place and we'd all be obedient in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Be seated. So, family matters. The family of God. The church matters. Can I just say this today that the church matters? The church matters. The church matters in this world in which we live in. See, because God, what God does in this world, he uses the church to do that. And when I say that, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the people of God, those who know Jesus Christ, the church. That's who the church is, amen? That's who the church is. So God uses the church to, to, to carry out his ministry on this earth. We are the hands and feet and mouthpiece of Jesus Christ. That's what he's called us to be. And the way we do that. And, and, and here's my point with that is, is that, let me just say this in a loving way to you today, okay? If you are somebody who is a believer in Jesus Christ, and you are not committed and supporting and being a part of ministry to a local church, you need to be. That's God's will for you. That's how, that's how God uses us. That's where God brings us to use our gifts and, and, and the things that God has gifted us to do. That's how God uses us. That's how, that's how ministry takes place. That's how I grow and develop in my faith. You say, well, preacher, I can watch it on TV or I can, I can you know, read a Bible study at home. Yes, you can, but I'm just telling you, there's nothing like being in the fellowship of God's people and growing together and fellowshipping together. And, and the great benefits and blessings of being a part uh, of a church is something that only if, if, if you haven't experienced that, uh, you need to in your life, in your Christian life. Our church is perfect? Absolutely not. You know why they're not perfect? 
Not because we don't have a perfect Savior and a perfect God and a perfect Lord who, who rules over us and who is the head of the church. It's because we have people like me and you that's there, okay? Because we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We, we tend to get, sometimes we want our own way, right? Sometimes we want our own way. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, talking about wanting our own way, uh, yesterday, uh, I was uh, working at my mom and dad's house. You guys know we bought that, and, and I had my grandsons out there. Uh, we were tearing out sheetrock yesterday, working together out there, and that was interesting. One of them had a hammer, one of them had a crowbar, or two of them had a hammer, one of them had a crowbar, uh, and they were beating on the wall. They were knocking holes in the wall. I mean, it was like the greatest day of their life to get to knock holes in the wall, you know? Uh, so we, we're going and doing, and, and of course, everybody wants their thing. They want their way, you know? Uh, Rhett, you know, every once in a while, Rhett would want the hammer. Bobo always wanted the hammer. Jack wanted the hammer. Uh, but finally, Rhett got a wrecking bar, the big wrecking bar. And, man, he whacked all day on that. Uh, hit himself in the leg a few times. And he didn't cry, though. He was tough. Uh, and we had a good time doing that. But we all want our way sometimes, don't we? The problem in churches most of the time is we, we want our way. We want our way instead of letting God have his way. And we're all guilty of that, all right? We're all guilty of that, and it's okay if you, you know, you don't have to shake your head, I'm guilty of that, but I'm just confessing for you and for me too, we're all guilty of that, okay? We're all guilty of that. Now, as we think about this particular story in the, in the book of Acts, and Acts, by the way, is just simply, it's the history of the early church, uh, the actions of the church, and we're going to talk about this uh, passage in different, in different areas of this passage because we don't want to be here all day. Uh, so we're talking, the first point of the message, or the first point of, the, of this series, the series is going to have three different points. It's all one message, but we're going to have to do all, all three of them at different times. The first one is this, addition comes from God. Addition comes from God. Now, let me just give you the other two where you'll know those, and we're not going to talk about the other two, but I'm going to give you those so you'll see the point, okay? Addition, everybody say addition. Addition comes from God. The second one is increase comes from God. And the third one is harvest comes from God. And the whole point is this, is that anything that happens in the church, anything, anytime the church moves and is, and is growing, it's cause it's, of God, it's from God, okay? That's the point. It's for us to understand that, that whatever God is leading us to do, it, it, you know, we need to be a part of God's church and what God is doing on this earth, okay? And that, and that is done through a local uh, body of believers, all right? So addition comes from God. That's the first one. Addition comes from God. Now go, uh, we're going to talk about this chapter, Acts chapter 2. It's a very important chapter. We know what happens in the book of Acts that, uh, you know, the disciples are waiting and, and you know, finally God sends down the, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down and Peter, uh, being filled with the Spirit of God, he gets up to preach. And we're not going to be able to talk about the whole chapter because time won't permit, but I want to, I want to just focus in on a few uh, different points and verses. Okay, first point under addition comes from God. The first thing is in verses 22 through 24 and 29 through 36, we see some compelling truths. Some compelling truths. Compelling truths. Look at verse 22 through 24 of Acts chapter 2. Peter is, man, Peter is preaching. Let me just tell you what. Peter is preaching unashamed. He, man, he's letting them have it. He, he's putting it out there, and they can either like it or lump it or, or, you know, whatever. He's just preaching, being anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. He's filled with the Spirit, and he's speaking. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Now, what's just happened to Jesus? He's been crucified. They've killed him. He, he's been, he's been, we know he gave his life. They didn't kill him, actually, but he, they, they took his life as they could through corporal punishment there, capital punishment there. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles. In other words, you've seen, you've seen the, the miracles. It says wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, Jesus, who was here on this earth that is, was crucified, you, you seen the works and the miracles, the wonders, the signs, which God did. You knew that God sent him. He was a man from God. And then he goes on, he says in verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. 
So what, what are we saying here? What he's saying here is this, is that it was God, you know, you didn't really take his life. It was God's predetermined plan. He already knew it was going to take place. It didn't happen because you made it happen. It happened because it was God's plan. It was God's plan for Jesus to come and for Jesus to be delivered and crucified and give his life for mankind. It was, it was God's plan. He says, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Now, I want you to just imagine you're sitting in that, in that crowd of folks right there. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, probably religious leaders and other people are there. And Peter begins to say this is him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless his hands in other words you were not supposed to do it was not justice and he goes on he says have crucified him and put him to death and it would be super sad if that was the end of the story wouldn't it be look at verse 24 whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it that's a praise God there isn't it so Peter is preaching. He's talking about, he, he is giving out compelling truths. He go, if you go back over in the first part of this, he quotes, or he gives a, a, from the prophet Joel, he gives him a, a passage from that. And then he goes down and he talks about uh, David. Look at verses, go over to verse 29 now. And still Peter is preaching. Verse 29 says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of this, his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified and what? Both Lord and Christ. Peter is preaching. He is giving compelling truths. He's giving compelling truths. And then you see in verse 37, after Peter has preached this message, he's preached this powerful message. I don't know how long it lasted, but I'm telling you, uh, I can assure you that these people, uh, something happened in their heart as Peter was preaching. It was compelling. You know how I know that? Look at verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, when they heard the words that Peter had said, and when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Now, what does it mean there they were cut to the heart? You know, what, you know what I believe that means? I believe that the Holy Spirit convicted them of their sins right at that moment. They knew that they were guilty. They knew that they had sinned. They knew that they had done wrong. They knew that they needed to do something about their sin. See, the problem with most of us is we come, we hear the message, we listen to what God has to say, we hear and we understand the truth because God's Spirit tells us that we've done something wrong. We need to get, get ourselves right, back right with God. We hear it. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, what are they saying? They're saying, listen, we under, we're guilty. What do we need to do about it? You know what? It would be a preacher's dream if people would say, listen, preacher, I know I have did this. What do I need to do about it now? I've not had that happen yet, okay? You see, not only was there compelling truths, but there was conviction of sin. See, when the Word of God is proclaimed in the power of the Spirit of God, there is going to be conviction of sin, there's going, to be the, there's going to be truths that are given out. God's truth is going to come out. The word of God's going to come out. It doesn't return void. So people are going to get under conviction of sin. And not only conviction of sin, 
But sometimes for us who maybe we're not in, we're, maybe we're not uh, in sin at that moment, but there is things that God is moving on our heart or working on our heart about us making a decision about. See, for me, I can remember uh, uh, for several years, uh, God was calling me to preach. And, uh, you know, I, I'd make all kind of commitments, but I didn't want to make that commitment. It seemed like a too big of responsibility and too big a job. And it was almost to me, it was almost like, God, you got to be kidding me. you got to be kidding. See, God calls us. He, he uh, compels us with truths of his word. When we come together, see, this is the great thing about the word of God and about God and who he is, is he meets us right where we are. If we're in a place where, where our life is just turned upside down because of, of whatever the issue, finances, you know, marriage, whatever it might be, he meets us right there where we are. When we hear his word, his spirit comes and he meets us right there. That's who he is. If we're lost, he meets us where we need, and he, and we help us to under, he opens our eyes, he takes the blinders off that the devil has got on us, and we realize we're a sinner, we know we need to be saved. But for them in this passage, they heard the truth, the compelling truth, they fell under conviction of sin, and they said, what do we need to do? They looked at Peter and the other apostles, what, what do we need to do? Tell us what we need to do. Look what he says in verse 38 through 40. What he says is, what we see here is we see that change is possible. Change is possible. Aren't you glad that change is possible? Aren't you glad that God loves us enough that, he, that change is possible? Look at verse 38. It says, then Peter said to them, again, that's, this, is, this is a preacher's dream. What do I need to do? And Peter, okay, here's what you need to do. You need to repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with, look at verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. They said, what do we need to do? And Peter said, let me tell you what you need to do. First thing you need to do is you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin and turn towards God, turn towards Jesus. The one who died on the cross, the one who you crucified. He's the, he is both Lord and Christ. He is your Lord and he is your Messiah that came of promise. He says, repent. Then he says, be baptized for the remission of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And he said, once you do that, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. See, change is possible. Can I just say this to you today? If you're here and your life is turned upside down, and if you don't, if you don't know Jesus Christ or if you're out of his will, change is possible. You are here and he loves you enough that he's not going to leave you where you are. If you'll just listen to him and come to him, he will change. He'll continue the process of changing you. Or if you're lost, he will change you. He will wash you white as snow. Forgive you of your sins, cleanse you, and put you on the path to being a child of God. He says, be saved from this perverse generation. Bottom line is this, Peter says, listen, get saved, get saved. Then we see not only change is possible, but then we see there's a little word in verse 41. What's that first word in verse 41? Then. 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 So there's always a then. See, they says, what do we need to do? Peter says, you need to repent. After you repent, you need to be baptized. And then after that happens, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's told them the truth. They, they, he's told them what they need to do. And then there's the then. So we call that the invitation, the time of decision. We call that the time when it's our opportunity to say yes or no to Jesus, to respond to what he says to us or to say no, not today. See, that's every time we come together on Sundays. We have that time of decision, that time for people to say yes to Jesus or to say no. And can I just say this to all of us? Every Sunday we either say yes or no. 
Because there's not a time when God's word doesn't compel us and call us to truth and call us to do, be closer to him, serving better, do all those things. But somehow or some, for some reason, and, and you know, that's going to make you mad, but if you get mad, you'll just have to love me in spite of me, okay? But you know what? One of the things that we've gotten out of the habit of doing is, is you know, when, when God calls us, we like to do that privately. And I'm not saying you, that there's not a time for that to happen, but I'm saying there's a lot more times that we need to come to this altar, not to come to me, but to come to God, to come to Jesus. And we don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. We might be, we, we might, well, what are they going to think about me if I come to the altar? What, what, what are they going to think if I go up there after he said this? They'll think I did this, or they'll think I've done that. Can I just say this? Are we really more worried about others than we are about him about the Lord really really is that who we are is that who we've become God help us if that's who we are because we really should be more concerned about what the Lord thinks of us than what anybody else does so the then equals this in verse 41 we talked about change possible. Now we see in verse 40 when we see church growth. And I say this simply because I want us to understand always that, listen, there is not anything. I don't ever want to be a person who manipulates or causes somebody to do something. I don't want to, I don't want to, to hound people and keep on banging people over the head. Like, you know what? I wish that preacher shut up. And if it means me coming down here and doing something, you know, regardless, I'm going to go where he'll leave me alone. That's the wrong reason to do it. See, the Spirit has to draw and has to move and has to work in our hearts. The Bible says in verse 41, it says, Then, everybody say then. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, or added to the church. So we're talking about church growth. When, when Peter said, listen, you need to be repent, you need to be baptized, he said, you need to be saved, is what he says. And when they heard that, it says, then those, the ones who, who gladly received his word, those who accepted his word, those who were glad to receive the words that Peter gave, glad to receive Jesus as their son, glad to be saved, it says they were baptized. They were baptized, and 3,000 souls were added to them. Can you imagine baptizing 3,000 people? Can you imagine us being here, being here to baptize 3,000 people? It'd probably take more than me to do that, but I'm telling you, I'd give it all I had. But we, it would be awesome, wouldn't it? We'd just, be, we'd just be going in, going in, going in, going in. I mean, we'd have a lot of, Miss Josephine would be ready to kill us because there'd be water everywhere in the back back here. <laughs> it would just be awesome if that were to happen church growth see when there is compelling truths and there is conviction of sin change is possible and when hearts are changed church growth takes place 3,000 souls were added to them notice in verse 42 we've got to hurry verse 42 says this and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers so church growth, and now we see in verse 42, there is continued discipleship and growth. Contin this is why we need to be involved in a church. It's because, listen, you can, you can think you can get this stuff on TV or, or you know, by tapes and all this stuff. And I, I'm not knocking that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just telling you, nothing takes the place of being with God's people in fellowship and learning. We, we, we challenge one another. We help each other grow. You know, that's what God wants us to do. So there's continued discipleship and growth in the apostles' doctrine, truths founded in Jesus' words and works. They continue studying the word, uh, studying the apostles' doctrine, those things that were founded in Jesus' words and his works. It says they were in fellowship or koinonia, that, that thought of where they were together, uh, not only in, in uh, you know, being together, they fellowship, seeing each other, all those things, but they were in all ways together. Breaking of bread, they were partaking of the Lord's Supper together and in prayers. 
See, all these things are benefits of being a part of the local church, being a part of, of God's church in a, in a body, in a, in a local body of people where you can learn together, you can fellowship together, you can experience the Lord's Supper together, and, and then you can pray for one another. There was continued discipleship and growth. And then verses 44 through 47, we see that there was commonality shared. Now, I want you to listen to the power of this. There was commonality shared. Verse 44 says this, Now all who believe were together. Now just stop right there for a minute. Now how many times could a, could a church say that all who believed were together? Now we're not talking about being together in the building. We're talking about being together in, in mind and spirit. Uh, they, they were together. They, they had all things, we'll see, what does it say the next word there says? It they says they had all things, what? All things in common. All who believe were together, they had all things in common. Now I'm telling you, you want church to grow, that's when it happens. It's when all things are in common. Everything's going on. Everybody's focused on Jesus. Nobody's worried about the color of the carpet or what's not happening or what is happening. They're just focused on Jesus. There was a commonality that was shared in the early church because they were all focused on Jesus, all focused on, on learning, all focused on fellowship, all focused on breaking of bread. That's talking about the Lord's Supper. All focused on praying for one another. And they all, all who believe were together, all things in common, verse 45 says, they sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all. You want to think God hadn't got a hold of these people in this early church? God's got a hold of these people. They were, they were willing to, let, to sell all their possessions, their goods, and then take that money and bring it to the church and let them divide it. Whoever needed it, they shared equally with it. Whoever needed it, they gave it to one another. You say, preach, you're crazy. I'm just telling you what the Word says. That's what the Bible says. See, we got this craziness in our country that think they can equal everybody. Can I just tell you, only God can do that. Only God can do it. It says they divided among them all as anyone had need. Notice the other. Daily with one accord in the temple. Every day they went to church. Breaking bread from house to house. Ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. You think these folks didn't have Jesus? They, these, these folks, God had, had, had just, he had changed their life. And they were loving one another. They were spending time together. They were sharing with one another. And they were happy in the Lord. And they were happy with one another. Verse 47 says this. Praising God, praising God. These folks were excited about Jesus. And every day they were praising God. And notice that second part of that says, having favor with all the people. Having favor with all the people. Having favor with all the people. Sounds impossible in our day and time. Sounds impossible for people to like me and you because we're, even though we're Christians. See, God had done something in these people's lives. And they were all together. And you want to know, you want to know how the church, you know, the Bible says that, that you'll, we'll, you'll, they'll know you uh, are my disciples if you have love for one another. You want to know why people don't know that, we're, that we are Jesus' disciples and really don't care about what we have to say? Because all we do is fight amongst ourselves. We're not, we're not loving each other. We're not getting along. We're, we're, we're more worried about, you know, this or that or whatever. Our convention right now is so divided, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, that's just the truth. These folks had all things in common. They're, they're, the thing that they got up to do every day was praise God. And it says they had favor with all the people. Listen, these folks would, could walk around town wherever they were, and people smiled at them, and they accepted them, and they loved them. I mean, they, they, had, a, they had an in route to people everywhere. 
Because there was something different about them. And they knew it and recognized it. See, because they had Jesus, they loved one another. And they treated each other well and they took care of one another. They seen a difference in them than they seen in themselves. Praising God, having favor with all the people. And then verse 47, the end of verse 47. And this is the part, we've done all this just to get to this part, okay? Everybody say, amen. amen. Okay, we did all of this just to get to this part, okay? Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, everybody say Lord. Lord. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now our first point was this. Our first point is this. Addition, addition comes from God. Addition comes from God. Again it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, moreover, there, that word Lord there is that word curious, remember? Now, moreover, the supreme and authority, master, controller, give increase, placed additionally in the called out Christian community, day by day, each person who surrendered his or her life to Jesus. See, in family matters, in church matters, addition comes from, from God. God grows the church. Preacher can't do it. Preacher can't have a great, you know, listen, it doesn't matter who it is, and I'm definitely not one of the good ones. I'm just saying it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if it's, it's Billy Graham. It doesn't matter. You know, you can say whoever you want to, whatever past you want to talk about, Adrian Rogers, and I like both those men. I, I, li- I love them both. Love to hear them speak, all those things, and I can give you a bunch more. Tony Evans, hold on, we could go. But the fact of the matter is they don't grow the church. They don't grow the church. God grows the church. God gives addition. God is the one who has to do it. If it's going to last and be eternal, it has to be from God. See, we can put programs out. We can put stuff, and I'm not against those things. We need to do those things that, are, that, that you know, compel people to come and be a part of things and unite and stuff like that. But the truth of the matter is, is that God has to do it. God has to do it. And if he does it, it'll last. If he doesn't, and it's some kind of, you know, because, oh, I like the preacher there. And that's good. They need to like the preacher there. Oh, I like the people there. They're friendly. That's good. They need to like the people. They need to be friendly. Yes, that's good. I like the connect. I like the Sunday school. I like blah, blah, blah. On and on and on we go. I like the fellowships. I like all. Yes, yes, yes. That's good. But here's the deal. God has to do it. And if he does it, it will last. See, we don't find anywhere in this story how, you know what, about halfway through the process, 1,500 of them got mad and didn't get their way, so they went somewhere else and started another church. We don't find that, do we? Why? Because God adds to the church those that are being saved. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, your word is powerful. It is life-giving and life-changing. Holy Spirit, we thank you for meeting with us today and convincing and convicting us of what you want us to do. Lord, of how you want us to be in your church. And God, I pray for this time of decision. And we come to that point we said a few minutes ago, the then. This is the then right now. What do I need to do? God's already told you what you need to do. Maybe it's to be saved. You need to come and and respond by faith, accepting Jesus. Maybe it's it's to, to, again, to unite with our church. Maybe it's to come and say, hey, I've been saved, but I haven't been baptized. I need to to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Maybe maybe God is calling you to to Christian vocation to say, hey, look, God is calling me to be a preacher. He's calling me to serve him in some special way. Uh, you know, whatever it might be. Maybe he's just calling you in the church, Lord, to be, to be a leader. To, Lord, to, 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 for people just to, to teach or to, he's gifted you to do that. And you need to say, hey, look, I want to be a part of what God is doing. And this is what God has gifted me to do. And I want to use that for his glory. So I pray today, God, that in this time of decision, the then time, Lord, that each of us would listen to you. It's not about me. It's not about what I could say. It's all about you. And God, that you would lead each of us to be obedient to do the things you've called us to do. 
And Lord, I pray that, that Lord, as you do that, God, and as the Holy Spirit convicts us and we're cut to the cut to the quick, Lord, we're cut there to where you convince us and convict us that this is what we need to do, that God will by faith step out and obey you. Lord, you be glorified in all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand, please?